season number three. And I am super, super delighted today to welcome Victoria Prantauer. She co-founded one of a really interesting foundation, it's called Hippo AI Foundation in her past work, where she focused a lot on data and AI in medicine. And now her main focus is on the question how to shape the companies of the future. As always, you can listen to Brain Fruits on Spotify, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a review and make sure to refer us to one of your friends. So first of all, I want to say welcome, Victoria. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Hannah. Very nice to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and giving me the opportunity Yeah, to be your guest. That is amazing. It's also just such a cool background that you bring to the Brain Foods podcast. I don't think we had ever anyone from a um, AI foundation that has worked with artificial intelligence and medicine. So this is really interesting. And I love also from your background that this is nothing that you were basically born with, right? Like you have a background in Master of Arts and Business. You have over a decade of experience in, uh, in different industries ranging from like uh, financial consulting to digital marketing. So I really love that you have this breadth of experience and can tell us a little bit today about how to problem solve, how to elevate potential with an entrepreneurial lens. Can you tell us about your startup trajectory to date and a little bit about yourself, Victoria? Thank you so much for the introduction. Where do I start? <laughs> So, okay, well, I grew up in the Austrian mountains and live now in Berlin since six years, but I won't tell you the whole story, so don't worry. So, as you mentioned, um, I worked in a lot of different roles and industries, um, so banking, real estate, um, sharing economy, and my last station was about digital health, as you mentioned, focusing on uh, medical data and medical AI, or more how we can accelerate innovation in this area. You know, I'm really passionate about creating win-win um, opportunities, identifying uh, potential pain points and finding solutions, and then maybe building MVPs and products um, and ecosystem ecosystems around it, you know? And this was also my approach when I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in the summer of 2019. So I really, tried from, from the beginning, you know, to, yeah, to, to accept the situation and, and take it as it is, but um, use this for, for something good. When you're diagnosed with um, such a disease, it really, there, there, is, there is so much emotion, you know, it's total, total chaos. Um, I always try to, or like to describe it as, imagine you're you're taking your hand back and turn it upside down. You know, this is this is how it, it basically felt, I would say. And the comparison with the hand back, imagine that you then have to take all the, the pieces and you know reorder it during this process of you know reflecting, reordering. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reminded me of what's really was really important to me and where my passion lies and this is where the topic of you know solving problems and enabling mm -hmm. potential comes in and um so this disease really opened up a completely new perspective for me wow what an experience and i'm really grateful that you share your journey uh, with us here i think that what i take from this is that um, collaboration and vulnerability to a lot of extent is really key for I think human experience, but also for, for problem solving. Um, I'm super curious to hear a little bit about your past um, experience here, especially. So there's so many problems out there, right? Um, and in order to find how to measure success, how to set up good metrics to see how far we can get to solve a given problem, we need one is good key indicators, but another thing is good data to show how how we get there, how far we are. I'm super curious, like, what's your thought on, on data sharing, especially in the world of medicine? You have been both a patient, you have been working in a foundation where, especially in Germany, there's a lot of discussion still around security, data privacy, and especially patients being very concerned about their very personal data. So this is really um, essential for, for our future because um, as you now mentioned, there is the 
the huge, you know, fear around data sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is true for patients and I will talk about that in a second, but I think it's also true for, for companies, but on, on company or organization side, I would call it less data fearing, more data hoarding. So, mm -hmm. so at the moment, the status quo is um, somewhere between data fearing on one side and data hoarding on the other side. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the challenge we have and uh, or the opportunity to create the, the most positive impact for all of us is how can we overcome these, these hurdles? How can we shape the future, right? That's the main question. How can we create the, the most positive impact? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it all starts with this access to data because yeah. it's, the, it's the base for, for research. It's the base for innovation. I think we're aligned on that, right? So um, there are a lot of challenges to overcome I think besides the, um, besides the fear and the hoarding. So mm -hmm. of course there comes in the, the tech perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the tech person, but of course we have to think about topics like uh, infrastructure and also, um, you know, the digitization of medical data. Yeah. Um, let, let give me an example, um, talking about breast cancer and especially, you know, to, to make an, an, a good diagnosis, you need uh, pathology data. Mm -hmm. So this is coming from body tissue, uh, which then is analyzed under the microscope. So um, a lot of the data is really um, in an analog way in, still in drawers. So um, we, we have the problem that we not even, it's not about the access to the data, that's the second issue, but first we have to digitize the data, right? Mm -hmm. To even discuss the access. How can we then share this data? Um, how can we, in this sharing process, uh, involve patients, involve um, the society? Let's, let's not just talk about patients because in the end, every one of us becomes a patient at some point, right? So how can we involve them, but don't burden them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so because just imagine, you know, there is so much research going on and, and I think it's not a solution to ask every single indiv individual every time someone tries to access the data, right? And there are ideas out there, for example, what is called participatory data stewardship. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe this is something we can then discuss um, a little bit in more depth, if you like, because yeah. it, it, it drives to... Um, involve the, the, the society, the patients, but don't burden them with the decisions all the time. Um, it's a lot of, I would say, awareness and mindset. Um, you mentioned that patients are, are fearing the, mm -hmm. the access to data. I, I, I think I will challenge that because mm -hmm. um, my theory is that patients will be the first mover regarding data sharing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love that you also refer to the patient as the first mover. I think that's a really great perspective to get on this um, topic. I would like to switch a bit gears and ask you about how did you find the confidence, especially after your experience being diagnosed with breast cancer, to start and co-create your own altruistic data organization coming from a totally different background. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is uh, really, if it, now, now when you mention it, it really, it really um, it's interesting, yeah, that I had a confidence in that moment. Um, I mean, first of all, um, I have to, I have to say I, it wasn't me alone, right? Um, so I, I found the founder of the Yeboi Foundation, Bart De Witte, and, and approached him within the first day after, after my diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and well, coming back to your question, I think the, um, what I would describe as my biggest strength is um, adaption. I'm, I'm, I'm able to adapt new situations pretty fast, you know, mm -hmm. accept it. Um, and then trying to use the pot potential lying within that um, chaos, what I described just earlier, you know. So use that um, energy coming with that situation and come up with um, ideas or the first step is that you 
you get a really a completely new perspective on things. Um, and, you know, I think or what what's important to say, and I think it's um, highly underestimated is that especially patients have a have a certain expertise um they, they only they know how their disease and and uh, all that's coming with the disease really feels right so um i i think i just thought if i won't work on it then who will work on it right yeah. and I, I, I truly believe you you don't have a, really a choice if you're getting sick you have um, you have two opportunities. You can you can choose your life or you can downfall. I decided to live and uh, yeah, with all the implications that that brought with it. I think the most important decision I made was to yeah to make something useful out mm -hmm. of this uh, yeah threatening situation. As I said, I found Bart, the founder of the Ebola Foundation, and I would describe it more that. Um, he empowered me to start this uh, project, the open data project. In the end, like making a profound change and taking the ownership and the responsibility to change what you want to do with your career and with your life comes down to making one choice, which is to either change or not, right? And there's, of course, a lot of things at, at stake, but I think the realization that um, you either live or you die, whether that's like really physically or almost, you know, mentally or soul-wise, if you're stuck in a job that you just really, really don't like, or if you're stuck in a life situation that you say you really don't want to be in it, but you struggle to change it, it's this one simple choice that you have to make. And that is quite threatening to many people and quite um, intimidating. And I love that you share, it is about choosing life and like realizing that it's your life to make a difference. It's no one else that will ever make this choice for you. Coming back a little bit to your um, to your mission to also help other breast cancer survivors to work with data, to work with technology. What is uh, the problem that a breast cancer survivor like you really wants to solve? Let's let's focus not just on breast cancer. I would like to frame it. Um, how can we provide all of us? Mm -hmm if we say the end goal, provide yeah. all of us with the best possible and holistic access to care. So yeah. um, I, I think there's still a lot of, um, yeah, unequal, unequal health healthcare access out there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is not just true if we focus, you know, on a global perspective, even on a local um, perspective, it's, it's true because, um, this has to do with how medical knowledge is distributed. So mm -hmm. in the end, this is coming back to, to individuals um, and doctors um, and, and, and patients as well, you know? So how good are the parties informed? Um, mm -hmm. What access do they have to the latest research or, or not? Or also, um, yeah, well, how good do they um, work with each other? All these yeah. things can influence the outcome of, of a disease or a treatment. What is like um, some of the perspectives if we think about different users, so to say? I mean, we have the patient, but we also have companies, right? Like the tech perspective to take on that a little bit more. And then maybe also providers like uh, hospitals. What is, their, um, what is their mindset at the moment? What mindset should they have? what I described earlier or would describe as, as data hoarding. Mm. So um, there is a lot of data available in the theory, but it's it's stuck in, in silos. And this is where I, I mentioned the, the idea of participatory data uh, stewardship. And the idea basically is coming from the Ada Lovelace Institute. Mm. It's basically the idea that there is a new kind of um, data organizations established. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really imagine it as a huge system of different um, data institutions. I think that's the, that's the idea. And you can choose um, this one you're really comfortable with because you're aligned in values, let's say, um, or you um, trust this organization mm -hmm. and then this organization um, 
distributes the data on your behalf. It can be really something in the future to, to overcome this challenge of, of hoarding and fearing. Now, if we look at that, like, but into how big this problem really is, well, there is like half of the world's population, we can say, lacks access to essential healthcare services even. So it's not a small problem that you are very passionate about, and I think many others as well. There's each year around 100 million that um, people that are pushed into really bad situations in poverty just because they had to pay for necessary health care out of their own pockets. Yeah. So these inequalities and access to health care is one of the biggest issues also that's addressed as part of the sustainable development goals. Right? Like goal number three really states that everyone should have good health and well-being. Um, so I think this is where this really feeds into how do you see data sharing how, um, would be helpful to achieve goal number three of the SDGs faster? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe let's uh, a step back. Let's go a step back. Um, so I think the, the potential, but also the problem is that the data is one of the most important resources of our time. Yeah. So um, it's the base, as we mentioned a few times today, the base for our AI driven future. Um, AI needs data, right? Yeah. So, um, but here's the great thing data itself is not limited. Mm. Um, so the potential is that um, we, we don't have to decide who gets access and who doesn't uh, because. As it's not limited, everyone in the end uh, can have access to the same kind of resource. But um, we are treat, treating data like, um, like oil. That's something we hear very often, right? Data is the new oil. And I, I think this is um, really a harmful perspective on it um, because it's then treated like a limited resource and it's not. Yeah. And the, the consequence is that. Um, if someone wants to work with data, it's really hard to get access to that data. Um, and currently the situation is that they often have to pay a lot of money to access mm -hmm. the data. And this, um, this status quo really limits who has access to data and who hasn't. And mm -hmm. who has access, the parties with um, yeah, the, the strongest financial situation, they can, um, buy in their access, so to say. If this resource is not limited, how then yeah. can we find um, feasible ways to share data with each other? What do you think, what role does this uh, democratization and access to data play in equal access to healthcare? From my patient point of view, I think I'd like to, to raise the challenge, um, who decides at the moment in which area research takes place, right? Well, organization companies financing the research are not um, always aligned with um, patients' needs or the patients' research agenda, if you want. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting uh, exercise to always look at the counterpart. So now we talk a lot about inclusion of data. What happens if we talk about exclusion of data? And this often really reflects the society's values and biases about who and what actually counts, because we often tend to collect only information about what we think is worthwhile to collect information about, right? So if we start to um, exclude a group from providing us with, with data, it means actually that we're really excluding in reality who will have a say in public policy, who will have a say in determining where a research agenda goes. So now mm -hmm. I think we need to transform as a society to rethink about who do we want to include and what can we afford not to include. You've taught us a lot about your journey and how you got um, into data from a really non-technical background, even getting involved into a AI foundation. What are some recommendations that you would have for our listeners to develop the confidence to start a foundation or to start your own project and use um, and harness the power of tech and data to make a positive difference in other people's life? Um, well, I think, and I, I, I think we learned this during this, this um, discussion, um, every one of us has a very unique perspective. 
um, not just a very unique perspective, but also a completely unique skill set. Yeah. And I often, to be really honest with you, um, talking about vulnerability and transparency, for me, it was often really, really hard because I changed my, um, you know, the industries and my roles so often that I sometimes felt, well, wh where do I have expertise in anyway, mm -hmm. right? So, but it is my passion to discover new topics. Um, so it's part of myself. And I learned to, to understand all these roles I went through um, that I gained in all of them a certain expertise. And I now call this, <laughs> this is Sue, I created the term, my liquid skill set. So um, your liquid skill set, that's a great, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. So um, I have all these different experiences and depending on the situation I'm in, I choose what kind of, my, what, what skill set do I, you know, bring in. Um, and now combine this with your unique perspective. And I think um, we can solve all the problems on earth we have. <laughs> Yeah, I love that because also problems are very liquid, right? They're changing all the time. Like what we might see as a problem today will probably already be solved by someone um, this evening. So maybe tomorrow there's a new problem arising from that. So I think you need a very liquid um, skill set in order to, to make a positive difference in other people's lives. Victoria, I am only left to say a big thank you for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. My pleasure. And, um, Oh, that's amazing. Where can people find you if anyone wants to reach out and say, hey, I'm so inspired by what you've said. I really want to have a chat with you. Yeah, of course, you can find me in all the typical social media channels um, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, or you can find me on my website. It's um, builttothefuture.tech. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah, more than happy to, to stay in contact, to exchange, because I always think, um, yeah, this is how we can progress. Um, one can have an idea, but it's only when people come together and collaborate and yeah, have discussions that we really can progress. That's so amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was really thank you great for the, to have you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. It was really a pleasure to be here. And I love your show. And you're doing great work um, finding all these um, people and yeah, um, sharing their knowledge with all of us. Thank you so much.